Hey, Robert, how are you? I'm awesome, Grant. Thanks so much for having me. You bet, man. Like, you know, I've been waiting for the last couple of weeks to have you on my show. I know when we first talked, um, man, I was just moved by not only your story, your mindset of what you've gone through the last couple of years and, and how you literally attack adversity. And, and that's what we're going to be talking about is your story and, and how you, and I don't want to go too much into it because I don't want to, I want my listeners to really get into your mindset and get to the heart of, of your journey. Cause it's just, um, it's amazing what you've done in the last couple of years and getting yourself to where you're at, but your spirit, your spirit of how you dealt with this, you're unbreakable. So I can't wait to see you two or three years from now. Um, cause what you've done the last two years from your injury has just been, it's been remarkable and amazing. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, shoot, this is definitely not something that I ever anticipated. If you would have come to me five years ago and say, Hey Robert, what's your five year plan? It wouldn't have been the things that I've dealt with. Uh, that's for certain, but, uh, but it's made me stronger and it's given me something that I can share with other people, something that can make people better. And so I'm excited to do that today, share my story, share some lessons, and hopefully we can all be more resilient after this. Yeah, man. That's, that's the word right there, man. I, I love it. Well, before we get into your story, um, let's talk about something I talk about not only on my show, but I, I talk about it almost every day within uh, my profession as a mental performance coach. But let's talk about being mentally tough. Mm-hmm. What, does, what does mental toughness mean to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, this is perfect because... So just kind of some background. Um, I was a Cal rugby player um, and at Cal rugby under the leadership of coach Clark and coach Bubs, we had a glossary, you know, a, a book almost of terms that we would have for things. And one of them was mental toughness. And our definition for mental toughness was the ability to focus on the next most important thing. So in rugby, that would be, you get a ball past you and it slaps right off your hands. It goes forward, turn over to the other team. And you're in that moment, right? When you're dwelling on it, you know, you're, you're, you're slapping yourself on the side <laughs> of the head and shoot, you know, why did I do that? Right. It's that ability to put that in the past, focus on what do I got to do now? Okay. Now I got to tackle this guy cause he's running right at me and I can't you know, be dwelling while I got some 300 pounder with a ball in his hands coming right at me. No, you have to be able to move on. From those moments that's how it translated from the rugby perspective and i've found that it's translating to everything in life with my recovery in those first moments um, on that first day when i got hurt when i'm laying there on the turf i can't move anything i can't feel anything i'm freaking out and i have my doctors telling me robert you're never gonna you're never gonna walk again you're never gonna move your hands you're going to be lucky if you can pick up a piece of pizza and bring it to your face. And that's if you survive the, the surgery was potentially yeah. life threatening. And now they're asking these things. So do you want to go into this surgery? You know, like I said, it's through the front of your neck. There's some important real estate. If something gets snipped, things can go bad really, really quick, yeah. but it's your best chance out of, out of recovery because your vertebrae are, uh, are fractured and we need to stabilize this region. You've got all this noise going on, wow. right? I mean, there couldn't be, more noise in this situation. I had everything going my way. I just got knocked on my back and I literally can't get up, right? Wow. To be able to be mentally tough in a situation like that, to be able to cut all that noise and think, what's the next most important thing to do right now? Mm-hmm. And that's what mental toughness is, right? Being able to cut all that out, yeah. all that stuff, and just focus on what can I do right now in this moment to get better. You know, I think um, whether if it's, in, I mean, in sports, I think for me that the most important word uh, in, when you're playing sports is next. Mm-hmm. What, what's next? Next play speed. What's next, right? So what next play? So that's huge. And I think we can actually, that translates into life, mm-hmm. right? I mean, obviously there's things that we can do in life to process, get the feedback and learn in the moment and all that, but getting ready for that next thing and and being prepared and, and so that, that's beautiful how you've not only you taken that lesson of, of mental toughness and sport, but how it, how you went through the, probably the most tragic thing in your life and you had all these moving parts, all these emotional things moving and you're still asking yourself like next. So that, that's beautiful. Um, you know, before we get into that moment when, uh, in 2017, uh, 
I want to set the stage a little bit. And you probably have already used this word since we've been talking, but, but when you, since you've been going through this incredible pursuit of, of overcoming this adversity, if you think about like a word to describe what you've gone through the last couple of years, what, do you, what word would that be? I'd say fortitude. Ah. And um, if you look up the definition of fortitude, um, um, I would somewhere along the lines of um, being able to push forward through adversity and pain. Um, and that's, that's exactly what I would put it at. It's a journey of fortitude. Um, you know, all the difficult thoughts, the pain, the hardship, um, still being able to push forward and do it with some positivity too. You know, maybe that's something that fortitude doesn't cover. Ah. But waking up every single day in what would be most people's nightmare, right? A quadriplegic. Being able to do that with a smile on my face, um, I would consider that the greatest success. Being able to get up and walk and all these amazing things, those are great. Um, but being able to be happy through it all, mm. man, that's one of the greatest accomplishments. It's huge. Yeah. You know, and, and, it's, and I'm just going to add on to that because when I spoke to you and it was over the phone a few weeks ago um, and in learning more about your story, there, when I got the phone, I'm just, I was amazed. I'm like, this dude's energy just through his voice. Uh, and it, it's not like you've been dealing with this for a decade or more. We're talking, this is a short time where your life got turned around and you're, and you've like, you haven't let it turn you around yeah. and and your spirit, your happiness, your positivity, your fortitude, your resiliency, man, it's, um, it's one of, it's one of the, probably the most remarkable things I've, I've witnessed uh, when it comes to these adversity, adverse things. It's just like, and I can't wait to even share more with yeah. my listeners. And, and really, I know we scratched the surface a little bit on what just happened, mm -hmm. but I, I, what I want is if you can just take my listeners back to that moment, 2017, the collegian rugby national championships mm -hmm. share the events that that had happened i know you shared a little bit on the aftermath piece but like take us back to that moment yeah so may 6 2017 i woke up in santa clara california and it was the day of the collegian rugby national championship i was playing for the cal rugby program um, and for those who don't know much about cal rugby very accomplished very history program, very. Uh, varsity sport at UC Berkeley. I believe it's 32 national championships that we have under our belt. Um, oh, wow. You know, just to, to put that in perspective, I think the only one who has more wins than that uh, in terms of the sport is the Harlem Globetrotters. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, Cal Rugby wins a lot. Um, it's, it was an honor. It was such an honor to get into that position. I started playing rugby over here in the Sacramento area at a school called Jesuit High School. Another great program, um, the most national championships out of any high school rugby program. Um, I came in there just kind of a football player who enjoyed hitting people. And, uh, you know, we had a pretty good team over there at Jesuit. They got me into it. I got that call eventually from Coach Clark asking if I would go play for uh, University of California. Of course, my answer was yes, absolutely. I saw this was the place where if I'm ever going to reach my maximum potential, it's going to be here every day at that school in that program was a blessing. Um, there's no other way around it. it. It was hard, really, really hard. The team was used to being the, the big fish in the small pond, right? Um, you know, and here you show up and uh, you're used to being the MVP on your team and now you're, you're third, fourth, fifth on the death chart, right? Um, but I climbed my way up to, to that, that number one starting spot at my position on the death chart as a sophomore, which is no easy or common thing to do. Um, I woke up on that day thinking it was going to be the best day of my life. It is something that I had worked for for years to get to that moment. A moment when, you know, I can be on national television, playing in the national championship, being able to raise that trophy, you know, pointing to a banner on the wall and saying, yeah. I was a part of the team that did that. You know, that's something where I'll be able to bring my wife and kids back to Witter Rugby Field for the rest of my life and point to that. Um, you know, those are the things that were going through my mind. I remember having our get together before we got on the bus you know, getting on that bus over to steven stadium in santa clara california we're in the locker room and getting taped up and there's kind of like that low murmur of chatter going on you know guys kind of tapping their foot and having that feeling on my stomach of it's like nerves but it's also excitement too. Yeah. You know, when you're ready to go out there and uh, 
you know, getting ready to sacrifice my body in a way. You know, rugby is a very physical game. Um, people say it's like football without pads, um, which is a lot. You know, it's 80 minutes of continuous play, going after it, um, really having to spill yourself out there. And that amazing connection between teammates, knowing that being able to look at each other and say, I'm going to put it all out here for you. Um, I'm going to get bumped. I'm going to get bruised. I can get really hurt. Um, I'm going to sacrifice that for you. Um, it was an amazing connection that we had together with our teammates. We had an awesome pregame warm-up, you know, standing over side-by-side side for the national anthem. Remember, we won the coin toss, so we decided that we wanted to kick it off. Uh, we wanted to hit him first. So the ref blows his whistle, and we're kind of thinking that this one's sort of in the back. Um, we were a pretty dominant team that year. We were playing Arkansas State, which, you know, after watching game film, doing some scouting reports, we were pretty confident that we would win this game. You know, still taking it seriously, um, but pretty confident that we were going to raise the trophy in the end. But very early on in the game, the opposing team, they commit a penalty. So we kick it into touch, um, which is just kicking it out of bounds. And then it's kind of like an inbounds after that. It's called yeah. a line out. And we were about five meters out, which is kind of an obvious mauling situation. And for those who don't know what a maul is, it's when the bigger guys we group together as a single group and we push to advance the ball. The defense's job is to come straight in and stop us from advancing the ball. And I mean, I'm a big dude, right? I was like six foot five, 245 pounds. I mean, like I move people that don't want to be moved. That is my job here on this field is to just push people. Right. So I'm kind of like drooling here on this field thinking like, this is my moment, right? You know, this is, this is something where we're going we're gonna to be watching this in game film tomorrow. And this is going to be something where I get a pat on the back. Now, as I'm driving in this mall, these opposing players, they start committing some penalties. At first, minor infractions. You know, yeah. a player comes in from the side, so um, and a couple more come in from the side. So the ref, he raises his hand to play advantage. It's kind of like in soccer where you continue to play until there's a major infraction or the momentum stops for the team with the ball. And um, then this player binds me around the neck, right, which is an automatic yellow card and if there's any sort of maliciousness or intent behind it it's a red card and uh that rule was actually instilled that year that if there is just contact with the head or neck the referee needs to blow his whistle immediately and issue a card to the player who committed the infraction now the ref's not calling it so i'm kind of all twisted and contorted another guy hooks me by my leg you know what are we on penalty number five here now Mm. Now this other guy comes in you know really low on me and um, slides down kind of towards my knees. So I start falling. But this guy, he still got me pinned in this neck lock, and I'm kind of fighting or whatever. But as I'm going down, my neck was totally flexed, my chin pressed to my chest. I hit the ground. My head completely rolled under. My face slammed against my chest. I felt this crunch in my neck, and then it was just poof. Every single connection I had from my brain to my body was gone. I mean, it was an absolute nightmare. Um, I had seen these stories, you know, on TV before, or read it online. And you see a moment like this where uh, someone gets paralyzed and they're laying there limp on the field. And I'm thinking, man, you know, what a nightmare it would be to have that happen to me. And here it was. It happened. Uh, it was like entering a completely different life. And uh, it was like being reborn in a way. Um, you know, before that moment, I was, you know, big Rob, right? You know, I loved that, like, physical presence I had. I had so much of my worth and accomplishment came from being a successful rugby player. Um, I had a lot of pride in that. And um, I loved being a body in motion. And here I was, completely halted. All my dreams, all my plans, everything was completely crushed. I, I'm sitting there thinking, am I going to graduate? I mean, am am I ever going to see my friends? I mean, I can't even move my arms, right? Am I going to be able to feed myself? My vision at that point was was horrific. It was a nightmare. It was, I'm going to sit at home my entire life staring at the window as my mom spoon feeds me, right? So I can just stay alive. And then she's going to die and I'm going to spend out the rest of my lives just kind of surviving, you know? Um, Not not really living, just surviving. that's, that's what it seemed like. My trainers and doctors, they came over to me and they're, Rob, can you feel this? Rob, can you move anything? Everything's just a no. 
No, I had completely nothing. The only thing I could move was my neck, which I said, Robert, do not move your neck at all. And then I get over to the hospital. We start doing some medical imaging, uh, you know, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs. Um, I'm, I keep asking, like, you know, I'm like, do you have any questions, Robert? Am I going to walk again? Am I going to walk again? Yeah, we don't know. We don't know. I come back. I'm laying in the hospital bed. My um, doctor comes in and he says, Robert, what happened to you is bad. It's really bad. And the reality is you will never walk again. Wow. You will never move your hands. We recommend that you go into emergency surgery very soon um, so to stabilize your spine so that you can do something like be able to pick up a piece of pizza and bring it to your face. And if you can do that, um, you beat the odds. You know, what, that, that's kind of what we're hoping for right now. Um, wow. Now is not the time to dwell on this. Now is the time to get really realistic. This is a very serious situation that just happened to you. Um, so here I am kind of thinking, you know, man, I just woke up division one athlete on this day, right? Everything's going my way. And now just a matter of hours later, I'm being told I will never move my body again. And that's if I wake up after this, um, before the surgery, I wanted to make some phone calls. So the first phone call I made was to my religious advisor. I wanted to ask him for prayers and advice. I told him about this prognosis. You know, I got my, uh, my brother holding the phone to my ear and uh, he said, Robert, yes, what happened to you is bad. And throughout this journey, there's going to be a lot of things that you just can't control. But the one thing that you will always have complete control over is your mindset. So your positivity, your ambition, your willingness to just accept this challenge and fight every single day is up to you. Nothing can take that away from you. It was the best piece of advice that I've ever received. And it was in the exact moment that I needed it. So my doctor came in, he wanted an answer on if I was going to go into the surgery and it was, yes, I'm going to get into the surgery. In that moment, I just made a decision. Uh, you know, I saw this vision for my life that I laid out earlier, not even being able to feed myself or anything. I said, I just can't accept that. I can't accept that. If I go throughout my entire life and something like that happened, or I spend the rest of my life in a wheelchair, I'll be okay. Right. I'm going to survive. But what's driven me since that moment is that if I look back on the end of the day and I didn't give it everything, mm. I will regret that forever. So in that, in that moment, it was that the first decision was made that every decision after this is going to be predicated on that initial choice that I'm going to choose to fight this. So I got on the phone with a couple of my friends said, you know, Hey guys, it's really bad. Here's what happened. Um, truth is I might never see you again. I just want to let you know that I love you. And uh, I had my last conversations. I had a priest come in, give me anointing, the sick before my surgery, rolled in, put the gas mask on, said my prayers, said goodbye to my family, um, praying that I would wake up from this. And that concluded May 6, 2017. Oh, man. I don't even, man. <laughs> you, you know, when you, when you uh, watch those, like a movie about this and you're moved, um, and again, I say this from total respect, but you know, one of the beautiful things about my show is that I have a front row seat mm. to stories like this. And I felt like I just watched a movie, um, you know, a real life one. And, and, you know, it, there's so much that's going through my head. I can only imagine what was going through your head and still what's going through your head. Mm. Um, you know, and I, and I think what is interesting, cause I was on a podcast earlier about, you know, uh, athletes that go through injury and, the emotional scars that athletes have to deal with. And sometimes, you know, athletes go back to their sport sooner because they, they want to play. They don't want to lose their position or whatever it is, whatever the motivators are. Yeah. Um, but you're seeing a lot of athletes like, I'm going to take a year off. Like I'm, you know, they could come back, but they're going to take a year off. And, and there's still emotional scarring when they do that. I mean, I'm 46 years old. I played, you know, football decades ago. I had a career ending injury. I, yeah. I still have some scarring. I think I've done a lot of work. Um, so there's, there's going to be two questions that are going to be kind of different from each other. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a couple of years for you. So it seems like you've accepted this. You accepted it the moment you went actually into that, that surgery, it seemed like. Yeah. How, how much work emotionally have you done with all this? Are you still working on the emotional side of it? 
And then the identity piece of being Big Rob, you know, um, are you good with, with being a different Big Rob? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so first addressing that emotional piece, obviously um, what happened on that day was extremely traumatic, right? I mean, it almost can't be yeah. more traumatic uh, to be put in that situation. Um, you know, that's who I, I was a rugby player. And, you know, I loved like being outside and being physical and active and immediately in one moment, all that was taken away from me. It was something that um, I might never have again for the rest of my life. Um, and the emotional times was uh, nighttime, actually, you know, during the day I had so much support. I mean, so many people coming over visiting me. It was so many that I couldn't even see all of them. Uh, it was like, it was too exhausting for me as I had, I had pneumonia. So I did the breathing treatments, you know, I couldn't even eat. I mean, that's a whole other thing. Right. Um, but in the nighttime when there wasn't all those distractions, when it was just me in a body that I couldn't feel or move, it was difficult. I mean, I mean, to be completely honest, I, I cried almost every single night, you know, waking up at two or three in the end or two or three AM just thinking, what happened to me? I mean, you know, not even like, why did this happen to me? But like, how, how did it even <laughs> yeah. happen to me? No, there's yeah. no way. This is my life right now. Um, it was tough. It was really, really tough. And I think what helped me throughout it all and what really changed my mindset on this is that I found a real purpose in overcoming this challenge. Um, we started sharing, you know, my rehab progress and sharing my story online. And the support was immediate. Um, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people reaching out, donating to my, um, my rehabilitation fund to pay for the medical expenses, uh, people stopping by. I mean, all these people all the way across the world that I had never met, letting me know how much overcoming my challenges helped them uh, overcome their challenges and wake up every single day with positivity, you know, saying, Robert, I think about you every day. I pray for you every single day. You know, whenever something's not going my way, I think about you and immediately I'm filled with so much gratitude. Um, you've touched my heart. You've changed wow. my life. Wow. <laughs> Being able to read to someone that you've changed my life, right? I only had to hear that one time before I started realizing this, it was all worth it, right? In the beginning, uh, the reason I wanted to get better was for myself. It was kind of the selfish desire of why I wanted to walk. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, right? When I started getting those messages, it wasn't even about me anymore. Getting better, fighting. It wasn't just so I could walk around and get from point A to point B on my feet. No, it was to see stuff like that, uh, to read those kinds of messages, know that I really had a purpose in this life. It's a purpose that I never would have had just playing rugby. Um, in a way, breaking my neck became a gift. And that really helped me through it was finding the purpose behind this challenge, being able to shift this challenge, not as a permanent setback, but as an opportunity, an opportunity to get stronger and do something that I never would have had, had that challenge not presented itself. That's question one. <laughs> question two <laughs> about the identity piece. Yeah. You're completely right. You know, like I said, being a big guy, just that physical presence, that meant so much to me. You know, I walk in a room and, you know, people kind of turn their heads and stuff like that. I loved that. And, <laughs> um, and I couldn't eat for the first um, month, actually. I couldn't swallow anything. So we had to put a tube up my nose, down on my stomach. It took like three days to get in there because I broke my nose so many times playing rugby. Wow. Um, but I lost a lot of weight. I mean, I lost 60 pounds in a month. And uh, it was a while before I was even able to look in the mirror because I was, I was bedridden. I couldn't even sit up without passing out. I looked at myself in the mirror for the first time and I could see the ridges in my sternum and mm. uh, my arms that just completely atrophied. Um, you know, my face like all, oh, you know, kind of caved in in the cheeks and yeah, I couldn't even see my neck under the neck brace, but, you know, just kind of feeling flimsy and yeah. uh, looking at my legs and they're just, they're, they're turning into sticks. And um, you know, my physical identity was gone. It was absolutely gone. And it was something that was really, really tough for me at first. I looked in the mirror. I said, this is not a body I'm proud of. Uh, this is not, so I can't look in the mirror right now and be satisfied about this. That was tough. Um, you know, looking in the mirror and being upset about something that you can't even control. 
it wasn't until that um, I started realizing again to that last point of how much it helped people. And I got a lot of recognition actually for being a person in a wheelchair. You know, my, my challenge is very visible. When people look at me, they can see a challenged person and it's almost a badge of honor right now to have that, that visible disability. You know, people look at me, people talk to me and they know that I'm a person who's overcome great adversity. And I think in a lot of ways, the way that challenge presents itself is a blessing because everyone goes through a lot, right? And they just don't get any credit because nobody even knows that they're going through that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. I get a lot of credit for what I go through. You know, I get a lot of perks, right? You know, I get the handicap <laughs> parking and I get to skip the line at the DMV, <laughs> or, you know, jokes aside. Um, right. There's a lot of pride that comes behind that too. You know, to be able to see those stars, um, you know, those battle scars um, that come with, you know, me being in a wheelchair and have some respect out of that. That's helped a lot for my identity to find some pride in those scars. Um, sure. As a person who's gone through something. And totally. Victorious. You know, it's interesting, and I, I, maybe from a metaphor standpoint, um, you know, because I can only imagine, you know, I played football for many years. I played with guys that were 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, you know, 300 pounds, mm -hmm. big mamma jammas. Mm -hmm. You're probably, you're one of those people, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you probably turn a lot of heads. But considering what you're going through, to be honest with you, I think because your energy and your spirit, like, even though that you're sitting down, you're not six, five, you're still turning people's heads. Right. And that's pretty damn cool. And, and the fact that, that something like that changed you completely changed somebody else completely. That's man. Talk about power. Like, and again, I understand, I don't mean power. I mean, powerful. Mm -hmm. The fact that you had something that totally turned your life upside down, but then it actually turned somebody else's life upside right up. Right. So how, how awesome is that? And it, you know, and you talk about support. Um, I mean, support systems are huge. And I, and I want you to share this a little bit just because I know you talked about a lot of friends globally, people reaching out, supporting you, giving you a lot of love. But this shows the character, like the essence and the core of the rugby program at, at UC Berkeley. Share with my listeners how the coach on all the way down, how they supported you during this time. Mm -hmm. You know, at first it was being there for me emotionally. Um, it was very evident immediately that with this program, should you fall, there's a whole army of people there to pick you up and get you going again. Um, we had a, they had a list I didn't even know about actually, where they would plan out to make sure that there was at least one person there every single day to come and visit me, whether it was a weekend, weekday, whatever it was, uh, to go over there and just be able to say hi, you know, be able to stay connected that way. Uh -huh. That meant a lot to me. Um, it really meant a lot to me, you know, throughout my, when then I went ahead and moved to Denver and I stayed in Denver for a year for my rehab, very physically disconnected uh, from my home, from my teammates, getting on the phone and uh, just being able to talk to someone like normally, right? You know, not, not where I'm, I'm talking about, you know, overcoming challenges and stuff like that. But just hanging out, you know, just just like the good old days, man, that meant a lot to me too. And then coming back to college one year after I got hurt, that's when it was really immense. You know, when there was that physical connection back again, uh, the support really showed. Um, my coach, Coach Billups, who is the associate head coach and the head strength and conditioning coach for the Cal Rugby program, uh, we were thinking, I, I want to continue with my rehab, right? You know, this is my goal and I'm not going to, I'm not gonna let anything get in the way of that. And he put it on his shoulders without me even having to ask. He just assumed that he was gonna become my neurological rehab physical therapist. <laughs> you know, and I mean, he can, he can get your bench press way up. You know, he can get you running faster. He can get you really strong. But he didn't know anything about how to connect a brain to the rest of your nervous right. system. But you right. know, he's, he's asking, what do I need to research? Who do I need to talk to? Um, the man is an angel. He is a human angel in my life. Um, I've had my most significant recovery probably under him. I've spent more time working out with Coach Phillips than, than anyone. And he hardly gets any credit. And uh, he doesn't even expect it. You know, um, that's just the kind of the man he is, the program, the Cal Rugby is, um, that he continues to be my coach 
for my entire life. Um, I'm going to have to like plead with him, please stop, stop coaching me for him right. to stop. Um, until I do that, um, I know he'll be with me every step of the way. Coach Clark has also been a huge piece of this to me. In the first meeting we had together, I went up to the field house, you know, and, you know, just talking and stuff. And uh, it was his idea to set up a spreadsheet, uh, you know, a Google like live updated sheet where we'd have my schedule, we'd have my routes of where I needed to go. And players would sign up in those sheets because the hills of Berkeley are insane, right? Insane. And I'm getting around in this wheelchair and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've built up my arms a little bit, but not nearly enough to be able to handle that. So, so we set it up to where again, to and from classes, to and from workouts, uh, players would meet up with me, you know, some that I didn't even know, right. Some that I didn't even play, um, and have that connection, you know, help me get to my class and, and hand me off to, to get out through my day and be able to study at a place like UC Berkeley and do it mostly independently, which is insane after yeah. the initial injury that happened to me. Um, Coach Clark has also really helped me in this next phase of my life with inspirational speaking. He does a lot of speaking of his own and, um, and helped me in this next period of my life, being able to take the story, these lessons and share it with other people. Um, he's helped me tremendously with that. Um, they've been in every part of my life since, uh, since I got hurt and, uh, wow. and since I came to college. So Man. just incredible program. Beautiful people that are around you and, and again, I just, um, I, I love programs that are, that are more than just about athletics. It's about, it's about human. It's about being human. It's about coaching and taking care of the heart of the athlete, which clearly they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to, I want to s- switch directions a little bit because there's something that I connect to. Um, but I want to talk about labels and titles because, mm-hmm. you know, obviously what I went through with my career ending injury doesn't even touch what you had to go through, but I, I was handicapped for about four years, be, you know, between my two hip surgeries. And so it took me about a year or so after my first surgery where my, where my doctor said, Hey, you have to be good with being handicapped and probably for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. So when I sat there and I'm like, I'm looking at him, I'm like, I didn't sign up for this, man. Like, I just, I just wanted to come in and have a hip replacement, you know, and have my life back. And, um, and I remember telling my dad that and my dad's like, son, you're not handicapped. And the more, the more that I like, I was, I was battling the fact that there's this title, this is, you know, this label of being handicapped. And then my dad's telling me, no, you're not because it, it to me, I was processing as it was a bad thing and negative thing. And it took me about a year and a half or so to go, you know what? I'm handicapped. I just, I, I am. And the doctors don't know how long this is going to be. I can't walk straight. I have, I've lost a lot of things that I, I can't do normally uh, that I used to. And, um, you know, and again, you know, getting the re, you know, reaping the benefits of, of being handicapped, you know, having the placard and, you know, getting, you know, pushed up at the front row and like, you know, going to concerts. I mean, they tell you where you're going to park and it's usually by the front door. Um, so, I mean, there was things that like, I'm like, okay, those are cool. But it was more that I had to realize, um, am I okay with being handicapped? And am I, am I okay being that for the rest of my life? And so luckily, you know, I, after four years, we did different things and I got myself back and, and everything's fine but I still have my placard and I have friends like they're like, do you want you to throw that away? I'm like, no, it's staying in the car with me and it's going to be, I don't use it, but I'm saying it's, it's expired, but it's yeah. a sign of, of man. I'm like, I, this is part of my journey and it's, yeah. you know, and I'm okay with saying that I was handicapped, you know, and, and I t- it taught me so many things. So with that, there's a couple labels that I want to throw at you. Now, being quadriplegic, um, you obviously, they said that you were never going to stand, do a lot of things, right? But just stand and walk. And you have actually, you're at a point a couple of years later where you are standing with some assistance and can walk with some assistance. Okay. So because you can do that, right? Do you consider yourself a quadriplegic? Mm. You know, I think it's actually, it's important 
to be able to accept those labels, those titles at first mm -hmm. um, with those disabilities. Because I saw a lot of people in the beginning in those hospitals when they're thinking, I'm not a quadriplegic, right? I'm not paralyzed. I'm not handicapped. I don't need to do this rehab. I don't need to work eight hours a day, the hardest I've ever worked in my life to get better. No, this isn't me. I'm going to walk out of these hospital doors in a week. Week passes, month passes, years pass. And being in the state of denial, nothing's going to happen if you can't accept that reality of what mm. happened. That was something that was so important in that first decision I made is that um, I'm going to fight for this and I'm going to go, but here's what I'm fighting, right? I, you need to accept um, that challenge and accept that label first and then decide that I'm going to change it. You know, am I a quadriplegic? If you look it up in a medical dictionary, yes, I'm a quadriplegic. But I would love to think of things like being paralyzed more as a mental state. You know, mm. um, you know, I might be paralyzed physically, but I do not consider myself paralyzed mentally. I do oh, not wow. <laughs> consider my state of life to be paralyzed. Um, yeah. And I think there's a lot of people in life who they have their physical abilities, right? They're very able bodied, um, but they get paralyzed mentally. And um, it's so difficult to move forward. Um, it happens to everyone. And, uh, you know, that's something where I take great pride is um, I may be paralyzed physically, um, but I'm doing my best every single day to never let this paralyze me mentally and never let this paralyze me from moving forward in my life and in those things I can control. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's awesome. That's beautiful, man. It's like, and I think there's a lot of people that are in your situation or similar that, man, that that's a huge less lesson, right? Like, you know, you can take my body, but you can't take my spirit. Yeah. You know? And I think it's great. And, and again, I don't want to compare obviously my experiences and my things to you. However, on a very small scale, I had to deal with identity issues. I had to deal with, you know, accepting labels and there's a lot of things that were somewhat similar, but when I left the game of football and I didn't have that choice, right? Cause this injury made that choice. I was upset, frustrated, pissed off. And I kept those emotions for a long, long time. And, but in the midst of all that, those two decades, almost two decades, I, I had a really hard time telling you that I was an athlete because I was like, I let, I'm like, I'm not that anymore. I'm not the old grant. And so it was very hard for me to, to talk about the touchdowns that I threw and the record, you know, breaking records and all that stuff. So it took me a long time. Now I would say in the last six years, five, six years, I have been, been saying in my vernacular, I am an athlete. I know I don't participate, but I'm still an athlete. So I still have that mindset. Right. So do you still consider yourself an athlete? Mm -hmm. I do. I really do. Um, I think that, the athlete's mindset, um, everything I learned as an athlete, I still use in my daily life. I mean, that ability to seek discomfort. I mean, mm -hmm. That's a huge thing <laughs> of being an athlete. Yeah. I mean, to get better, you have to put yourself through incredible pain. You know, your muscles are aching. You wake up after a game and you're just like, why did I do that? Um, but you know why, right? It's to get better and uh, right. seeking discomfort, pushing yourself to achieve growth, um, those are all things that you know, I did not as an athlete. Those are the things that I do now. I'm still working out, right? I mean, it's, it's very different than what I used to do, but right. it's, still, it's still pushing myself. Um, and I, I, I definitely wear that as a badge of honor still. I would still consider myself to be an athlete um, in many regards. And uh, I might not be putting my cleats on. I might not have my name on the roster. Um, but I will, I will always live like an athlete for the rest of my life. Totally. You know, it, it's completely different. Um, but, but again, it's a whole mindset, the whole athlete mindset, like you're talking about, like corporate athletes. Mm. Like, there's a lot of athletes. There's a lot of corporate athletes or workplace athletes that never played sports, but because they are for whatever reason connected to sports or they really are drawn, they still, they adopt those things to get their mind and body prepared so they can actually compete in a workplace. So, um, so I think it's like you said, it's a state of mind and, and I only bring those up just because I think it's probably therapeutic for me to still talk about it, about the things that I had to go through. And, you know, I never, 
necessarily played on a championship team, like where we won the championship. You have, right? And, and I, I could probably understand, I could probably hear what the answers are going to be already. But, you know, when we talk about still being an athlete and you're still in your, your chair, do you still feel like, is there, can you live out the fact that you're still a champion? Like, cause you went through all those, those national championships, you know, with, with your team. So, I mean, do you still feel that, that spirit of, of a champion? Mm -hmm. I do. I definitely do. Um, yeah, as a competitor, that's always the ultimate, right. And, uh, you know, when I remember before these games, um, you know, in high school and in college, um, getting that, that pregame speech in from the coaches and the common thing, the thing they always say is this is something that will last forever. You know, this is a legacy winning yeah. the championship. You know, this is something you will always be able to say that I was the 2015, 2016, 2017 rugby national champion. You know, I was a part of that team. You know, you always have the ring on your finger and the banner on the <laughs> wall um, will always be a part of you. Um, it's something that I carry with immense pride um, to be with that, um, to have that part as my identity as a national champion, um, you know, a starter on the team that was able to do that. Um, it's something I'll carry with me forever. Absolutely. Yeah. That's beautiful. And, you know, it, obviously I love the way that how resilient you are and the way your, your unstoppable mindset is just incredible. Now I also want to, there's another side to all this because we are human mm -hmm. and so we deal with shit in our life. We deal with bad days. We have negative thoughts. They're there. Mm -hmm. So as far as your rehab, right. And they, like when you have bad days, when you have negative thoughts, how do you, how do you deal with that? How, what's like, what is there a process or, you know, obviously you said when you're alone, that's, that's when, and for most people, when they're alone and the hamster is going a hundred miles an hour, sometimes it's hard to control. So how do you deal with your bad days? Yeah. You know, one thing I always try to do is I, tr I try to never have a bad day. Now I'm going to have bad moments. Mm, right. I'm going to have good. a bad workout. I'm going to wake up on the wrong side of the bed and I'm groggy and I'm just pissed off. Right. I'm going to have bad moments, but I really try to be conscious and not let those bad moments control the day. I try really hard not to have bad days. Yeah, There's huge. two things that really help me with this negativity. The first thing is perspective. Um, in every challenge that I've gone through, there's always someone else who's gone through something more difficult, right? When I was doing my rehab and I wake up and I'm complaining and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm spending like 10 minutes trying to pick up a fork and stab a grape, right? I mean, it's just maddening stuff, you know, picking up a marble and putting it in a, in a cup, spending like 10, 15 minutes and thinking about that. And then I would see people on the floor below us. That was the traumatic brain injuries. You know, these wow. are the people they couldn't even remember their parents, you know, um, they were comatose. I mean, they're dealing with these challenges that are so immense. I think in anything we go through life, there's always someone that's going through worse. And whenever something like that happens, I just tell myself compared to what? So I'll say, oh man, like this COVID thing, right? Being able to walk across the stage at graduation, that was a huge part of my vision. It was something that was taken away from me from something I couldn't control. I can be all mad about the fact that I couldn't walk a step across the stage at, gradu at graduation, but compared to what, you know, I'm having a hard time in this session. It's really, you know, my legs just aren't working for me. I'm not walking as well as I usually do, but compared to what old Robert Paylor would have just slapped me in the face for complaining about what it right. being difficult for me to walk. <laughs> that's something that's really helped me. And then the other thing that I think is really important for everyone to have is a mental diet. Um, you know, as athletes, um, as anyone, understanding the physical diet is pretty straightforward, right? The mm -hmm. more you consume positive um, foods, you know, the things that are good for you, the more positive you are going to perform. And I think the same goes for our mind. The more we allow those negative thoughts to cycle through our mind, the more we're surrounded with negative people, negative situations, and we don't counteract that by taking in positive thoughts, getting on our phone and looking up inspiring stories, doing something that makes you happy, surrounding yourself with positive people, you know, picking up the phone and calling your mom or dad, or brother, whoever it is that uplifts you, those need to be real intentional actions. Those are something that I did every single day. I keep a yeah. gratitude journal now. I write three things that I was grateful for every single day. 
doing something like that, it's a habit, right? To where I'm putting my mind space in a very positive place. So I don't allow those negative thoughts and occurrences to dominate my day. Man, I know that you and I talked about this uh, on our initial call, but for me, when I think of like, cause your mindset, again, unstoppable, unbreakable. I mean, I can throw all these different words out there, but you know, if you truly want to have a mindset, whatever that is, there needs to be intention behind it. So intention equals mindset. Mm -hmm. And so by doing your gratitude work, your intentional work, you can tell it's paying off mm -hmm. because your mindset is, is the way it is and your energy is the way it is. And, it, and it's, it's awesome. And I, and I love how you frame the whole mental diet um, or, you know, having that mental diet. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple uh, questions before we, we sign off here. Again, I can talk to you for hours on this stuff. Um, and if you're cool with talking about this, you know, this goal, right? I mean, in the last couple of years, considering that you weren't supposed to walk for the rest of your life, now you're, you've leaps and bounds. I mean, you can stand up, you know, with assistance and, and walk with assistance. What, is there a timeline? What's that goal? That, have you set that goal for you to go, I want to walk without having any assistance? Mm -hmm. You know, this is something that's really interesting because when I was playing sports, you know, when I was playing rugby and, you know, I want to bench press you know, 315 at this time, right? Yeah. You know, that was my goal. And that was kind of my accountability to get there. Or, you know, I want to be a national champion this year. I want to start my sophomore year on the Cal rugby team. You know, those were a lot of things that were bound by time. These injuries, spinal cord injuries, and I mean, a lot of the stuff we deal with life, it's really hard to control that timeline, right? There's some people that have an injury like mine and they're walking out of the And there's some people that never walk for the rest of their life. There's a lot of people that have to deal with that. Now, sometimes they worked just as hard, but they didn't quite make it. When it comes to the big overarching things that I want in my life, I consider that my vision. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly when that's going to happen. You know, things are kind of you know, foggy and you, can, you can't see every single detail, but I have this vision of what I want in my life. And now the goal setting is what can I do right now in this moment? You know, what can I do every single day that's going to get me there to that vision? So I like to think of goals in my life now, of things I can do right now. So a goal that I have is get on my feet every single day. You know, okay. whether that's, you know, just doing a few sit to stands, just standing up out of my chair, you know, kind of like a 30 minute thing or I'm pounding on a big workout, you know, two and a half hours. Um, I try to make sure I do electric stimulation. I don't know if you ever heard of that before. Since oh, yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. A lot of that. I try to get on that Easton bike at least four times a week. That's my goal of things that I can do. So um, that's something that I think has been very beneficial for me is to set my goals in the frame of what can I do right now? so that I can get to that vision. Yeah, man, it's all about process. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we can control. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, process drives results. Everybody wants to win, everybody wants a championship, everybody wants to start, right? But you have to actually work a process to get to that point, right? And, and I love it how you're, you're, keep, you're, you're keeping it simple and you're focusing on things you can control, which is the process, so that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, what about, you know, one more question here before we sign off. Now you've shared so much, so much about just kind of your mindset and how you've overcome adversity. But if you were going to formalize when you reflect on all of this, like, what do you think you've learned the most about yourself? Mm, that's a good question. I almost have to start, stop and think about that. Mm. The thing I've learned more than anything is, um, is how blessed I am in every single moment. Um, I've learned that power of gratitude. Um, you know, it's easy in life to wake up every single day and, uh, and not think about how much of a miracle that is, to just wake up, to just be alive. All these things that I thought were complaints, right? I got to go back and I got to read a hundred pages tonight. Boo hoo. Oh man, we got to run gassers. You know, coach is blowing his whistle again. This guy's out of his mind. He's going to kill us. Right. All these things that I thought were just like torture. These are things that weren't positive in my life. In one second, I would have given anything to have that again. My ability right now to just breathe my ability right now to be on this podcast, 
to be home, to be able to talk to my friends, being able to, I've realized how blessed I am as a person. Um, and that's what carries me throughout every single day to be able to wake up in that gratitude for the day and, uh, and say, I'm grateful for this and I'm gonna take advantage of every single second because I know that it's temporary. Uh, these things on this earth, um, they're temporary and, um, and I'm gonna enjoy it for every single second I have it. Wow, man, that's, uh, that's the shit right there. I mean, it just is, man. It's, uh, I, I love it. And it's about the thing about what I do as a mental performance coach. It's about being present. I coach yeah. people to play present in life. If they can be present in life, they can be present on the field. If they can be present on the field, they can be present in life. It doesn't have to be the field. It could be a pool. It could be a court, whatever. Yeah. But it's about being present to everything that we do. Um, and for what you've gone through, like the, the, which is, it seems like that's the thing that you've earned the most is just being right now, mm-hmm. right? Being right now where you're at. And so that's, that's beautiful. Um, how can my listeners connect with you on social media, follow you, follow your story and also follow where you're going when you're speaking? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So first way is through my website. That's www.robertpaylor.com. Um, I got a chat feature in there. I love interacting with the people um, who've been inspired by my story. It's what fuels me, right? Is to be able to hear people say that and get the takeaways that they're taking out of the lessons that I'm giving. So please reach me on my website, www.robertpaylor.com. It's got links to all my social media um, sites and stuff like that to be able to follow my rehab progress. I try to post things every single day. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was walking in the pool just with my hand on the side. So things are getting better um, and they're gonna continue to get better. So. I hope that I can continue to be inspiration to help feed that mental diet for everyone, um, to help fuel um, people's performance and, um, and have some interaction out of it. It means a lot to me. Well, Robert, man, I mean, as you know that, I, uh, man, I, I love your energy. I love the way that you've dealt with this, man. And I love you, man. The fact that you're, like, you're sharing your story, man, that vulnerability. Um, thanks for, for everything, your energy on this show. Uh, I know my listeners are going to love this and uh, and I just can't wait to see you just conquer this and, and just feeling and seeing you thrive is just a beautiful thing as a human. But, but again, thanks for being on my show, man. Absolutely. Grant. Um, all my appreciation goes to you. Right on.